Hello, good morning to folks on the US West Coast. Good afternoon, good evening to folks who are uh, in Europe and on the US West uh, East Coast. Uh, so my name is Liz Bong Jones. I am a principal developer advocate at a, uh, at a data analytics company called Honeycomb. Uh, and I'm joined by Emily Gorsinski. Hi there, I'm Emily Gorsinski. I am the head of data at ThoughtWorks Germany. So good Abend aus Berlin. Um, shall we? Yes, let's go ahead and dive into it. So Emily and I were asked to give this presentation because data science is a field that has a lot of ethical implications. And we want to make sure that people are aware both of what their ethical obligations are and also how to act in support of their ethical obligations. So the work here is presented uh, from material that Emily and I originally wrote a few years back for a book called Seeking SRE about some of the cutting edge topics in site reliability engineering. But it turns out it's pretty cross cutting. It also applies to data engineering. So let's go ahead and make sure that people are aware of what we're going to be talking about. Um, and fortunately, this is a little bit of a heavy talk because um, you know, when things go bad with mismanaging data, uh, they go really, really bad. Uh, we're going to be talking about things that we've encountered, including sexual harassment, discrimination, state violence, uh, hate speech, and death threats. Um, these are unfortunately some of the hazards that we have to deal with as professionals who are marginalized in certain dimensions, as well as what happens if we see that data is being misused and how it can be misused. So let's start off by talking about what the ethics crisis is in tech and why we all have an obligation to care about this stuff. So there are a couple of different dimensions in which uh, the ethics of technology, uh, we need to care about it as people who work in the field. The first dimension is the ethics of our product. Uh, what is it that we're actually building day to day and is it perpetuating bias in ways that we do not anticipate? So first of all, we can talk briefly about, uh, go back a slide only. So I can talk about the idea of poor accessibility, uh, for instance, excluding people who have print disabilities, excluding people who have, uh, who have hand tremors, right? Like that your product is not accessible to people who are marginalized along the axis of disability, uh, unless you explicitly design for that. But then there are things that are uh, that your boss may ask you to do something that is unlawful or unethical, and you need to be prepared to think about what am I going to do. So let's talk about a couple of examples. There's Theranos, where they uh, produced medical testing kits that didn't actually work and returned incorrect results. There's Volkswagen, who returned uh, incorrect results when they are being tested for emissions, causing environmental harm. There is Cambridge Analytica, where they use the power of data science in order to uh, push micro-targeted propaganda that was maximally targeted to mislead people. There's Absher, which collated a lot of information about where women in the country of Saudi Arabia were moving, uh, like whether or not they could board an international flight and male guardians could control with the push of a button, uh, whether or not to allow a woman to board a flight. But I think one that's particularly interesting is La Liga. Uh, La Liga de Fútbol Español, which is a Spanish national soccer league, and they uh, eavesdropped on every single person who installed their app, uh, thinking they were getting sports scores, in order to determine what the locations of unlicensed uh, bars that were streaming their their uh, their games, right? And these are things that we need to speak up against, right? Like these things don't get built unless we, as software engineers and data scientists, actually work on them. So let's maybe think about not building things that are unlawful or unethical in that way. But it's not just product. Uh, there are a couple of other ways that we wind up perpetuating discrimination. So there's also work conditions, right? That data science is a field of technology and in technology we encounter all kinds of fascinating problems where people wind up on the basis of their race, on the basis of their gender, on the basis of what their previous pay is, uh, being not paid the same for equal work uh, or being given uh, the incorrect job title. So we need to do something about that, right? And this is actually something where we can potentially lend our skills and say, you know what? That's not right. Like that's not fair. That is statistically not a, not a coincidence that you have accident, accidentally uh, un underpaid women by 10 or 20 or 30%. There are also things that we can speak up about in terms of people being treated unfairly, people being asked to work uh, excessive hours, and then things that are much more overt, things like harassment, discrimination, and hostile work environments. But wait, there's more. 
Um, we also have an impact upon the broader ecosystem of society, right? Where if you have, uh, if you work on a product like Uber or Lyft uh, or, or Amazon deliveries, right? Like you are working directly on something that is contributing to an ecosystem of independent contractors who don't necessarily get health benefits, right? For where people don't get minimum wages, right? And that has consequences for people's financial stability, that has consequences for people's ability to speak up and organize if they're not all kind of employees of your company. And it results in kind of this permanent disenfranchisement and disempowerment and di uh, dismantling of labor protections. We also, at least in the times before COVID, had people who worked in cafeterias, uh, people who worked driving shuttle buses, and all these people enjoy much less plush working conditions than those of us who are engineers. And then we have to think about, you know, when we go home, right? Like, or those of us who are sitting at home now, right? Like the fact that you're able to afford your place means that someone, you've paid more than someone else, right? And that has consequences for where people can live. That has consequences for, uh, for the health of people and where, and where the health of where they live. And our employers lobby, unfortunately, large tech companies lobby against things that are pro-worker and they lobby against things that are pro-environment. And therefore, we kind of have to say, you know what, maybe that, uh, that political action committee that, that my employer is asking, asking me to donate to and passing the plate, no thank you. I don't want to give money to you in order for you to, you know, give it to a senator who's going to take rights away from, from Black people or take rights away from transgender people. Um, like, you know, no amount of protecting net neutrality is worth that. And then there are things that are kind of at the intersection of this. Um, things that are both working conditions and also uh, and, and also product conditions. So for instance, is it okay to ask someone to work on a project that harms uh, them, right? Like if you have someone who uh, is who is from Iraq, right? And they're being asked to work on a project that does drone surveillance in Iraq. Is that is that something that they're going to feel super comfortable with? Or if someone's working on, you know, Twitter or working on social media, right? Like, and they are asked to maintain a public presence, doesn't that mean that you have an obligation to protect them in their Twitter life and not just in their, you know, sitting at the computer uh, on Zoom life? So there's a lot of interesting ways that we need to look after each other and our neighbors uh, in order to make our society better and more just. So this is not Emily and I's first time discussing this. Emily, when, when did we first talk, give a talk like along these lines? I think it was. So I think together this was um, in 2018 uh, in Dusseldorf uh, that we first spoke on stage about this. But I think that you and I have been independently doing this um, for at least two or three years before that. Yeah, so like, you know, part of why this is a crisis to the point that Percona asked us to speak at this conference, right? Like this would have been a little bit more of a fringe topic five years ago. And unfortunately, the reason why abuse of technology is so common in our discussion now is that we failed to act collectively five years ago, right? The best time to act was five years ago, 10 years ago, but the second best time to act is now. So that's what we're imploring you to do. So this is ethical debt. It's like technical debt, except for it's ethical debt. So Emily, why don't you tell us about this lovely machine learning model? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Liz. Um, so, you know, one of the things about talking about ethics and technology, and, and despite the title, this is not a talk about ethics. We're not going to present to you some like easy band-aid solution that's going to all of a sudden fix our problems. Um, this is a systemic, systemic problem that needs systemic solutions. And the, the truth is, if we were to give this talk every month, it would be a different talk with different examples because there is no shortage of really, really skeevy things happening in the tech industry um, from a perspective of equity, justice, um, and fairness. And a perfect example of this is the way that technology is used to to wash or to sanitize otherwise abhorrent behaviors. There is an example of um, the Immigration Customs Enforcement Division in the United States. They had built this um, software system that was supposed to recommend whether or not a detained immigrant could be let out uh, while they were awaiting their court appearance for whether they were allowed to stay in the country or not. 
And this was supposed to take into many considerations, things like their, their background, their age, um, the likelihood of, um, of committing a crime or, or recidivism, um, all sorts of different factors. And it turns out that after running this system for a while, they just actually made it always output detain. So it's really just a return true. It's not even an algorithm. Um, but they went through this whole process, this whole song and dance of saying, oh, well, it's, it's not us, it's the algorithm. We're using technology in order to distance human decisions from human beings who are making the decisions. These examples are, you know, they're everywhere to be found. And of course, the, the, the United States presidential election is coming up uh, in just a couple of weeks. And so every, everybody is talking about right now, Facebook and social media, things about fake news and disinformation. Are, are foreign state actors meddling in the American elections? Are Americans meddling in other foreign elections? Um, what is happening in our, uh, our mainstream tech ecosystem? And the reality is that I'm a data scientist with over 15 years of experience, and I cannot understand the full scale of the algorithms that are being used, nor can the data scientists and engineers who are building them. So what does this mean in terms of a platform that has 2 billion people? What does this mean for the average person who is not a world-class software engineer, data engineer, data scientist? And so we've just seen Example after example, right? The last time, as I mentioned, so Liz and I gave this talk in Dusseldorf in 2018, in August of 2018. In the intervening years, these are just some of the headlines that have come out since we last gave this talk together. We've seen mass shootings, we've seen genocide, we've seen conspiracy theories, we've seen the pandemic, be th the success of the pandemic management be threatened by disinformation and fake news and conspiracy theories spreading on social media platforms. Moreover, um, some of you might be aware that I am also, in addition to uh, a data scientist and an engineer, I'm also an, an extremism researcher. Um, and within this universe, one of the main concerns is the way that extremists, violent extremists, are using technology platforms more or less unrestricted in order to recruit people to carry out violent acts. And they are recruiting people as young as 11 years old. They're doing this on sites like 8chan, which has now been uh, taken down and has, has re-emerged on a different platform. They're doing this through video games, through, through your Call of Duty, through your Battlefield games. They're doing it through mobile phone games. And they're, they're doing especially it. doing it through YouTube recommendations, right? That our machine learning algorithms are surfacing this content and exposing them to it and steeping them in this until they find a white supremacist community to join. And so this is a, a grave concern amongst the community of people who study violent extremism, that this is a problem that has largely gone unchecked because it is up to the tech companies to be the ones to check this. There are very few other legal options to stop this behavior. And so, so what we wanna talk about today is not about ethics in terms of there is some grand ethical code that we need to apply, but really to talk to you as people, because it's not about whether or not some company, some um, nonprofit organization, some professional society has a code of ethics. It's about whether you do or not. Please. Yeah, so in particular, I think we have an obligation to act. And like we said, like five years ago was the right time to act. This is the second best time to act. So let's figure out what we can do today, especially knowing that, for instance, the US election is two weeks from now, right? What are you doing to stop misinformation from spreading facilitated by your employer over the next two weeks? Like this is not a trolley problem. This is not like a problem involving intangible uh, trade-offs. This is something that we need to do something about right now. So how do we actually go about doing this? How do we go about fixing this problem? Um, so brief, 
a little introduction um, halfway into this talk about who I am. So I've been, I've been in this uh, space for a long time. I've been in tech for over 15 years. I was a research engineer and actually work, used to work for a defense contractor. Um, so I've seen firsthand the, uh, the type of um, outcomes that technology uh, unchecked can do uh, or, or can have. Um, I'm also a, an advisory board member, as I mentioned, of two uh, university-based labs that study extremism. And um, in a really uh, terrible sort of set of circumstances, um, I've been assaulted for my work multiple times, including three attempts of murder, and I have the rare distinction of having survived two different terrorist attacks. Um, so my passion for ethics is not just because um, I have some political agenda that I want to foist onto the industry, but rather that it is a, really a matter of life and death for me. Um, I've written about this in many places, um, but really the most effective thing I can do is speak to you as technologists. And likewise, I've had some successes with uh, causing ethics to be a factor in decision-making at large tech companies. Um, so I used to work at Google. Um, I used to be a manager at Google. And I've been doing labor activism for over 10 years now. Um, in particular, I was a key factor in stopping both Project Maven at Google, which would have uh, caused the Google compute uh, the Google Compute platform to be complicit in targeting of, uh, of dissidents in the Middle East, as well as uh, rallying against Dragonfly, which was a project to aid the People's Republic of China in identifying dissidents in, uh, in, through their ser web searches in, in the People's Republic of China. So not Emily and I's first rodeo, but we're here to kind of teach you what we know so that you can put those skills to, to work um, inside your own workplaces. But one thing I do want to emphasize is that like, this is not an abstract thing, right? Like as, as Emily and I were saying, like, you know, Emily's purposely survived terrorist attacks. And I personally survived having white supremacists at my employer um, try to get me fired from my job, try to make it a hostile work environment for me and for every single other woman and person of color at the company. Um, so Google's ideological echo chamber was a document published by James Damore um, coming up on, I think, three years ago, three and a half years ago. Um, and it was a very damaging document in terms of being covert white supremacist recruiting material. Um, and the document leaked. And when it leaked, there was this firestorm of, you know, oh, should we punish the person who wrote it, blah, 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 blah. And eventually the person was fired and he sued Google. And his lawsuit was finally settled a couple of months ago, which is why I'm actually able to talk about it finally. Uh, so in particular, one of the things that happened was that this was an attempt to silence uh, women and people of color and non-binary people and queer people at Google. Um, they, when white supremacists are working at your company, and I assure you they are working at your company, um, they try to identify people that they can try to get fired, that they can try to uh, that they can try to subject to harassment, because they want to create an environment that is a white men only uh, culture. And so, in particular, this is a list of eight people that uh, that were publicly blamed for James Demore's firing. Only one of us was an executive at Google, and now at this point, only half of those people, less than half of those people, still work at Google. Um, and two or three of the people on this list have permanently left technology, right? This is what happens when you don't have solidarity, when you don't stand up for each other. Um, so we need those voices in the room to speak up and say, this stuff is not okay. So when they go after the most marginalized, like that's one of the techniques that they're using in order to perpetuate white supremacy. But it's not just threats to employment. Let's, let's, talk, about, let's talk about this too. Uh, they've gone specifically after me and they've specifically issued death threats uh, and death threats that are specifically connected to my gender identity, sexual orientation, and the fact that, and, and my race. And Emily's seen a lot of the same things too. Yeah, and um, as Liz mentioned, you know, this is not unique uh, to, to either uh, her or myself, but um, when you become somebody who is outspoken about um, the uh, 
the course of the technology industry and the ability for, for example, white supremacists to, uh, to organize on the platforms that we're creating. When we try to put the brakes on the, the flow of capital somewhat uh, to start to think about whether or not what we're doing is the right thing, um, this has a violent backlash. And it's been so violent that I actually moved from the United States to Germany. Um, I emigrated to for my safety. And that wasn't enough because if you don't read German, this uh, headline down here um, in the bottom is about a group of neo-Nazi terrorists who actually flew from the United States to Germany in an attempt to find me and potentially kill me. So this is something that is, as I mentioned, deeply personal and deeply impactful. Um, this is why we give this talk because frankly, we're very tired. We're very tired of fighting this fight. We're very tired of being the ones who have to stand in front of the, the, the train um, and asking it to stop. We need your help. We need your help as engineers and we need your help as people. We need your help as compassionate individuals who want and have a mandate to create a better world for the future. So these are the three things that Emily and I are asking you to do, just three things. So first of all, what we're asking you to do is we're asking you to learn from what's happened. We're asking you to conduct retrospectives to really understand, uh, next slide Emily. Uh, we're really asking you to, to understand how do I adopt not just a blameful behavior that says, you know, here are the two people that I need to fire from my company, but instead how do we systematically reinforce our companies and the systems we build against abuse? Secondly, we need to have you think about how to prevent harm. We need you to think about what are the negative and anticipated cases? Could a domestic abuser use this? Could a rapist use this? Uh, could someone who was compromised at your company use this? How are you guarding against misuse of the data that you are the custodian of? And are you providing appropriate controls to the person who owns the data? Thirdly, Emily and I are asking you to minimize the amount of data you collect. That means don't collect unnecessary data that you don't need. Encrypt your data so that it can't be intercepted by a nation state or not even a nation state actor, just like some random person sniffing Wi-Fi. Encrypt your data at rest and in flight. And protect against insiders' threats, recognizing that you have white supremacists and you have misogynists who work among you who would be happy to leak information if they could get their hands on it. And make sure that your data is secure against, for instance, employees in the US being forced by US authorities to turn over data, or employees working in the People's Republic of China being forced to turn over data by governmental authorities. And better yet, delete the data that you don't need. Expire data so that it can't be used against your users, or else. Yes. This is what happens if you do not minimize your data. Yes, there's, um, it's a particularly interesting set of case studies now with uh, contract contact tracing uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, depending on where you live, if you go to a restaurant or some other uh, place, you might be asked to fill out some paperwork uh, with your name and your contact information. There are growing cases of misuse of this data because our laws are not strong enough to protect people. Uh, for using this data, um, but also we have created this culture of um, it's actually kind of okay to abuse data because everyone else does it. Um, so there are cases of the police using um, contact tracing data to uh, track people down and, and um, find people who are witnesses to crimes. Um, there's cases of uh, staff at restaurants using contact data to ask people out on dates inappropriately. And then there's also, um, <clears throat> excuse me, plenty of case studies um, where people who were running a website um, regarding, for example, the George Floyd protests or the J20 protests in the United States, who have simply run a website whose servers have been seized under extremely broad search warrants by law enforcement. So what can you do in order to stand up to these things? You need to force change inside of your employer. And that means that you're going to need a little bit of backup. Fortunately, I got you. First of all, your company probably has some mission that claims to do good. Like put that to work. Even if the executives don't actually sincerely believe in it, you as an employee can say, hey, I'm just following this co company code of conduct that says do good. 
Secondly, Emily and I did disk codes of conduct. You know, they're not a panacea, right? Like they have to be coupled to action, right? So when you're going to, for backing, you can say, look, the ACM, the IEEE, they support me in saying that you should not be misusing and collecting and misusing this data. Thirdly, collective action really does matter. Uh, that we as engineers are very, very valuable. We're very, uh, not you know inherently, but in terms of rarity of skills. So therefore, if we all go on strike, if we all quit, if our company no longer has a GDPR privacy officer or privacy department, right? That means that your company potentially has to think about that risk when they're deciding whether or not to do something unethical. Fourthly, there's the issue of local laws. Um, in the US and in Europe and in many places around the world, there are labor protections and national rights to labor organizing, but the remedies are a little bit retrospective. So we still have to think about how we protect each other if we face retaliation, even if we can go and sue afterwards. Fifth, you can whistleblow, right? Like if you hear about something unethical and you don't think you can get employees at your company to do something about it, you can speak out publicly. There's a risk to you. You'll likely be fired, you'll likely be sued. But sometimes that cost is worth paying in order to make sure that the public's right to know about things that are grossly unethical uh, is, is preserved. So we need to think about our backup strategies, right? What are we doing to support each other? How are we supporting our coworkers and ourselves in order to make sure that we are not being complicit in things? But this change is really worth the cost. So unfortunately, Emily and I don't have enough time to go through all of this in detail. We'll publish our slides later. But like, if we weren't already in a crisis, like, you know, there would be a number of steps to take. But like, we're at the all else failed step, right? Like, this is this is the place where we need to step up and really, really rise up in in masses to prevent unethical things from happening. So, what does this concretely mean? This means that we need to think about how we act sustainably. Yeah. <laughs> Ethics needs to be, like every other part of engineering, a continuous process. It needs to be part of every story, everything that we do. We must always look at, you know, what are we doing the right thing? What happens if this is not the right thing? We need to run risk analysis as part of our jobs as engineers. We need to understand the impact of our technologies. We need to know where is the break glass in case of emergency button for when something goes wrong. Hopefully it never will, but like any other sort of deployment, we have to have these, these systems in place. So talking about break glass, employee petitions, hugely effective, walkouts, hugely effective, talking to the press about your protected labor rights, super effective. And you know, you can quit. 5% of Coinbase employees quit. I think that's pretty fucking powerful. So like, you know, prevent crises, by, by giving them the time and attention they need before they become crises. But that being said, we are in a crisis right now. I'm sorry, that's the bad news. So there aren't really band-aid solutions. The best thing that we can do is guard, strengthen, and extinguish. And those are things that uh, we can credit privacy engineering for. Yeah. And there's no, like I said, there's no band-aid solution, right? We, the reality is we're never going to write an ethical code that interrupts the flow of capital. So we have to create a culture in which doing the right thing is the profitable thing, that in a culture in which doing the right thing is the thing that we're supposed to do and there's no other question about it. And that does require people to step up, do things that make them uncomfortable and have a set of rules and guidelines for what is right and what is wrong and what actions must be taken. We also have to look beyond the tech industry, right? These are problems that have been solved before. The medical uh, research uh, industry, the pharmaceutical industries, engineering industries, none of them are perfect, but all of them have something. We don't have even a shred of something. So we need to be proactive about this. Like we keep saying we're in a crisis, but you know what? It can get worse. And, and there will be other crises better. after this too, right? Like we have to there fight this crisis and think forward to preventing the next crisis. Exactly. And, you know, we might need to Think around what does it mean for us, you know, in the middle of a pandemic when things are going on, we do have to put on our own gas masks or oxygen masks first or gas masks, depending, maybe you're at a protest, um, but you do have to take care of yourself. So that is also important. 
Um, finally, I think we need to wrap it up. We're just about at time. We do have a list of resources here um, for some more reading and, uh, and other uh, people to follow. Uh, we'll publish these slides and, and you can find them there. Um, but we'll just kind of quickly page through them. And yeah, coworkerfund.org if you want to support mutual solidarity. And yep, Amazon workers, Google workers, Microsoft workers, like people all around the industry are stepping up and take act taking action. So remember, tech won't build it if we stop them from building it. Thank you very much.